afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Adventure and Mystery Book Club. I am Bill Mallory, branch manager of the La Jolla Library. So glad you could be with me today for our next reading of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Uh, today we are reading chapters 35 and 36. Um, just to recap briefly what has gone on, um, our heroes have uh, are still plotting to escape the Nautilus, but so far have not had much luck. Um, there is a... Uh, a lot of stuff has happened, actually. Um, they have found the shipwreck of uh, where there is tons of gold and silver that uh, now lay at the bottom of the ocean and at this bay, and the uh, Captain Nemo shows them this in, this in the sense that this is where I get my money from, and he collects up this uh, fallen gold and silver from uh, sunken ships. Tells the, then we hear the story of the, the historical story of the, the sunken ships. Um, he takes them to a, uh, an underwater city, uh, devoid of life. There's, uh, except for ocean life, of course, lots of uh, seaweed and, and uh, critters scuttling around, uh, but it's clearly a city made by the hand of man. And it turns out this is the. Uh, remains of Atlantis after it's sunk, and uh, then he takes the, or he takes them to a, a, a volcano, an underwater volcano. Uh, you know that's also you know kind of where Atlantis is, and he keeps thinking, well, maybe what'll happen is enough lava will flow out of the volcano, and after maybe several centuries, this uh, hidden sunken island will be pushed back up to the surface. You never know. Um, so he is, of course, he being Professor uh, Pierre Aranax, um, he has his uh, faithful manservant, Conseil, and he has the Canadian harpooner, Ned Land, uh, with him. And uh, all the while this is going on there, uh, Ned Land especially is kind of plotting to uh, find a way to get off of the Nautilus and get back onto land. And, and Professor Aranax is very somewhat guilty. Uh, he feels bad about it, but he will, he wants to stay and uh, see all these new, interesting parts of the ocean that he would never be able to see otherwise. And uh, so, so he's Ned Land's plans get thwarted, but the professor is kind of okay with that. So, so if you're ready, we'll start chapter 35, which is entitled The Sargasso Sea. The Nautilus had not altered its course. For the moment, therefore, we had to give up any hope of returning to European waters. Captain Nemo kept heading south. Where was he taking us? I did not dare think. That day, the Nautilus crossed a strange part of the Atlantic Ocean. Everyone knows about the great current of warm water known as the Gulf Stream. After leaving the channels around Florida, it heads for Spitsbergen, but before it reaches its destination, it splits in two near the 44th parallel. One current continues toward the coasts of Ireland and Norway, while the other bends southward near the Azores, touches the coast of Africa, and then swings back toward the West Indies. Now this second branch forms a kind of ring of warm water around an area of colder water called the Sargasso Sea, which is always calm and immobile. It is like a lake in the middle of the Atlantic, and the waters of the Gulf Stream take nearly three years to travel around it. The Sargasso Sea, properly speaking, covers all the submerged region of Atlantis. Certain authors have even stated that the numerous plants it contains have been uprooted from the plains of this ancient continent. Nevertheless, it is more probable that this algae and sea rack have been taken from the shores of Europe and America and brought there by the Gulf Stream. This was one of the factors which led Columbus to believe in the existence of a new world. 
When this hardy sailor's ships arrived in the Sargasso Sea, they had considerable difficulty navigating in the midst of all the plant life impeding their progress. The crews were terrified, and it took them three long weeks to cross it. Such was the region the Nautilus was now visiting, a real prairie, a thick carpet of seaweed, sea rack, and bladder rack, so dense and compact that the keel of a ship would have difficulty cutting through it. Captain Nemo did not want to get uh, his propeller entangled in this mass of plants, and he therefore kept his ship a short distance below the surface. The, this word, sargasso, comes from the Spanish sargazo, which means gulf weed, the principal constituent of this immense bed. The scientist, Mori, in his uh, Physical Geography of the Earth, gives the following explanation for the presence of marine plants in such a peaceful portion of the Atlantic. Quote, It seems to be caused, he said, by the phenomenon familiar to everybody. If one places pieces of cork or any other small floating objects in a glass of water, and then makes the water in the glass go round and round, one will soon see the scattered fragments come together in the center of the liquid surface or, in other words, at the place uh, with the least motion. In this phenomenon under discussion, the uh, glass is the Atlantic, the circular current of water is the Gulf Stream, and the central point where all the floating bodies come together is the Sargasso Sea." End quote. I share Maury's opinion, and I was able to study the phenomenon in its very midst where vessels rarely penetrate. Above us, there were all sorts of strange objects floating among the brownish seaweed, tree trunks uprooted from the Andes or the Rocky Mountains and brought down the Amazon or the Mississippi. Many wrecks and parts of keels and hulls so weighted down with shells and barnacles that they could no longer rise to the surface. And some day, Maury's other idea will find proof, namely that these objects will eventually turn to coal and form an inexhaustible mine, a precious reserve prepared by far-sighted nature for the time when men will have exhausted the mines on land. In the midst of this inextricable fabric of plants and seaweed, I noticed some charming pink star-shaped alchionia. alchionia. Some anemones dragging their long hair-like tentacles behind them, and green, red, and blue jellyfish, among which I particularly remarked Cuvier's large rhizostome with their bluish swimming bell edged with violet. We spent the entire day of February 22nd in the Sargasso Sea. We saw great quantities of fish who, since they are great lovers of marine plants and shellfish find abundant food there. The following day, the ocean once again took on its normal aspect. Then, for 19 days, from February 23rd to March 12th, the Nautilus remained in mid-Atlantic, traveling at a constant speed of 100 leagues every 24 hours. Captain Nemo obviously was anxious to complete his underwater program, and I had no doubts that after going around Cape Horn, he would return to the South Pacific. Ned Land was, therefore, right to worry. Escape was out of the question in these broad seas without islands. Nor was there any way to oppose Captain Nemo's will. There was nothing to do but give in, and what we could no longer obtain by force or trickery? I like to think we might obtain by persuasion. Once this voyage was over, might Captain Nemo not set us free under oath never to reveal its existence? We would have kept our word, but how could we broach this delicate subject to the captain? How could I ask him to set us free? Had he not stated plainly from the start that the secret of his life required us to be perpetual prisoners aboard the Nautilus? Wouldn't my four months' silence on the subject seem like tacit acceptance of our situation? 
Wouldn't bringing this subject up again only result in arousing his suspicion and lessening our chances of escape if some favorable circumstances should come up later on? I thought about these various points, weighed them, turned them over in my mind, and discussed them with Conseil, but he was no less perplexed than I. In short, even though I am not easily discouraged, I realized that my chances of ever seeing my fellow man again were lessening day by day, and above all, just when, the cap just when Captain Nemo was rashly heading toward the South Atlantic, during these nineteen days, nothing unusual occurred. I saw the captain little. He spent his time working in. Uh, he, he spent his time working. There we go. In the library, I would often come across books he had left open, and especially books on natural history. He had apparently been leafing through my work on the ocean depths, for it lay open with his notes in the margins, sometimes contradicting my theorems, uh, my theories and systems. But this was only this was the only way in which the captain corrected my work, for he hardly ever discussed it with me. Sometimes I could hear melancholy sounds from the organ which he played very expressively, but this he would only do in the depth of the night when the Nautilus was asleep in the wastelands of the ocean. During this part of our voyage we cruised for entire days on the surface. The sea seemed deserted. We only saw a few sailing vessels headed for the East Indies via the Cape of Good Hope. One day we were chased, down, chased by dories from a whaling ship, which undoubtedly took us for some huge whale of great value. But Captain Nemo did not want these worthy people to lose their time and trouble, and he ended the chase by diving below the surface. This incident seemed to greatly interest Ned Land. I am sure he regretted that our iron whale had not been killed by the whaler's harpoons. The fish Conseil and I saw during this period differed little from those we had already studied in other latitudes. We mainly saw some specimens of that terrible genus of cartilaginous fish, which is divided into three subgenera and includes no less than 23 species. There were striped sharks 15 feet long with rounded tails and seven black lines running parallel down their backs, and ash gray purlon sharks with seven gill openings and only one dorsal fin placed almost exactly in the middle of their bodies. We also saw some large dogfish, a voracious species of fish if ever there was one. Even though fishermen's stories are not to be believed, it is said that in one of these fish was found a buffalo head and an entire calf. In another, two tuna and a sailor, still in his uniform. In another, a soldier with his saber, and in yet another, a horse with its rider. It must be said, though, that these stories seem a bit doubtful. In any case, none of these animals ever allowed itself to be captured in the Nautilus's nets, and I therefore had no way of finding out how voracious they were. A school of playful, elegant porpoises accompanied us for several days. They traveled in groups of five or six, like wolves hunting in packs. Apparently these animals are no less voracious than dogfish, if one is to believe a Danish professor who claims to have removed 13 sea hogs and 15 seals from the stomach of a porpoise. To be sure, it was a grampus, the largest known species of porpoise, sometimes exceeding 24 feet in length. The family of the delphinians uh, includes 10 genera, which and those I saw were from the genus Delf delphini. Noted for their muzzle, which is very narrow and four times as long as their head, their 10 foot long bodies were black on top and pinkish white with occasional spots underneath. We also noted strange fish of the order Acanthopterygii and the family of Cyanidae. Some authors, who are better poets than naturalists, claim that these fish sing melodiously and that together they form a choir 
that could scarcely be equaled by human voices. I do not deny this, but the Siena day that we saw did not serenade us as we passed, much to my regret. In addition, Conseil classified a great number of flying fish. We were fascinated by the extraordinary sense of timing with which porpoises chased them. No matter how far or in what direction they flew, and they sometimes even flew over the Nautilus, when, when they landed, these poor fish always found porpoises waiting them with open mouths. There were both uh, per peripedes and red gurnards with luminous mouths who at night would trace fiery lines through the air and then plunge into the dark waters like shooting stars. We continued cruising at this in the same fashion until March 13th, but on that day, the Nautilus was used for experiments in sounding the ocean depths, which were of great interest to me. By then we had covered almost 13,000 leagues from our point of departure in the high Pacific. As marked on the chart, our position was 45 degrees 37 minutes south latitude and 37 degrees 53 minutes west longitude. These were the same waters in which Captain Denham of the Herald had taken soundings down to 45,000 feet without touching the bottom. It was also there that Lieutenant Parker of the American frigate Congress had not been able to reach the bottom with soundings of 49,670 feet. Captain Nemo decided to send his Nautilus down to check these soundings. I got ready to take notes on this experiment. The panels of the lounge were opened, and the necessary preparations were made for diving to such prodigious depths. As one might well imagine, it was out of the question to make such a dive merely by filling the reservoirs. They might not have sufficiently increased the ship's specific gravity. Moreover, in order to come back up, this excess water would have to be expelled, and the Nautilus's pumps would not have been strong enough to overcome the outside pressure. Instead, the side fins were placed at a 45-degree angle with the Nautilus's waterline. Then the propeller was made to go at full speed, and its four blades churned the water with indescribable violence. <clears throat> the force of this vibration made the Nautilus's hull quiver like the string of a violin as we went deeper and deeper. The captain and I sat in the lounge and watched the pressure gauge with its needle moving rapidly across the dial. Soon we had left the zone in which most fish can live. Although some can only live on the surface of seas or rivers, others, though not so many, live at fairly great depths. Among this latter kind, I noticed the Hexentius, a sort of shark with six gill clefts, a telescope shark with enormous eyes, an armored mal malarmat with gray lower fins and black upper fins, and protected by a pale red layer of bone. And finally, the, a grenadier, who, since we saw him at a depth of 4,000 feet, was capable of living under a pressure of 120 atmospheres. I asked Captain Nemo if he had ever seen fish living even deeper. Fish? he replied. Hardly ever. But in the present state of science, what can we presume to say? What do we know? We know, Captain that as you go into deeper regions of the ocean, plant life disappears faster than animal life. We know that in places where one still encounters living creatures, one will not find a single marine plant. We know that scallops and oysters live at depths of 6,500 feet, and that McClintock, the hero of the polar seas, brought up a live starfish from a depth of 8,000 feet. We also know that the crew of the HMS Bulldog brought up another kind of starfish from a depth of 15,720 feet, or more than a league down. Would you therefore still say, Captain Nemo, that we know nothing? 
No, Professor, replied the captain. I would not be that impolite. But all the same, I would like to know your explanation as to how creatures can live at such depths. There are two explanations, I replied. First of all, there are vertical currents caused by differences in the salinity and density of water, which produce sufficient movement to sustain the rudimentary life of encrinidae and starfish. Right, said the captain. Secondly, we know that oxygen is the basis of life and that the amount of oxygen dissolved in seawater increases with depth, or, in other words, the greater the pressure, the more of it goes into solution. Oh, did you know that? replied Captain Nemo, somewhat surprised. Well, Professor, what you say is true. I shall merely add that fishes, air bladders, contain more nitrogen than oxygen when they are caught near the surface, and more oxygen than nitrogen when they are caught from the great depths. And this proves that you are right. But let us go back to our observations. I looked at the pressure gauge. It showed we were at a depth of 20,000 feet. We had been diving for an hour, and the Nautilus was still going down. The empty water around us was extraordinarily clear and transparent. An hour later, we were down to 43,000 feet, about three and a quarter leagues, and we still couldn't see the bottom. Nevertheless, at 46,000 feet, I could make out blackish peaks rising from the midst of the waters. But these could have been the tops of mountains as high as the Himalayas or Mont Blanc, or even higher, and we still had no way of evaluating the depth of the valleys between them. In spite of the powerful pressure around it, the Nautilus went down yet farther. I could feel its iron plates quivering where they were bolted together, steel bars bent and bulkheads groaned. The glass panels in the lounge seemed to warp under the pressure of the water, and this strong ship would undoubtedly have been crushed if, as cap the captain had said, it had not been built to withstand pressures like a solid object. As we brushed past these rocky slopes lost beneath the sea, I could still see shells, serpuli, spin orbis, and several specimens of starfish. But soon, these last representatives of animal life disappeared, and below a depth of three leagues, the Nautilus passed the limits of uh, underwater life like a balloon rising into the atmosphere where no one can breathe. We had reached a depth of 52,500 feet, four leagues, and the Nautilus's hull was withstanding a pressure of 1,600 atmospheres, or 23,500 pounds on each square inch of the surface. How extraordinary, I cried, to sail through regions where man has never been. Look, Captain, look at these magnificent rocks and these uninhabited caves in a place where life is no longer possible. What a shame that we can bring back nothing but the memory of these unknown sites. Would you like to bring back more than a memory? asked Captain Nemo. What do you mean? I mean that nothing would be easier than to take a photograph of this area. I was about to express my astonishment at this new proposition, when, at an order from the captain, a camera was brought into the lounge. The water outside the panels was absolutely clear. Our artificial light caused no fuzziness or shadow, shadowiness. Even the sun could not have served our purposes better. By controlling the speed of its propeller and the angle of its side fins, the Nautilus remained immobile. The camera was pointed at the ocean floor, and in several seconds we had obtained a negative of great clarity. And here I give the proof. One can see the primeval rocks, which have never seen the light of day, granite formations which form the globe's solid base, deep caves hollowed out in the mass of rock, and everything outlined with the in incomparable clarity 
and shading of certain Flemish masters. Then, in the background, there is a horizon of mountains. I cannot describe this ensemble of smooth, black, polished rocks with no moss or other growth to spot their surface, cut into strange shapes and resting firmly on a carpet of sand, sparkling beneath the electric light. After taking this picture, Captain Nemo said, Now let us go back up, Professor. We must not expose the Nautilus to such pressure for too long a time. All right, I said. Hold on tight. Before I had time to understand why the captain had uh, given me this piece of advice, I was thrown to the floor. At a signal from the captain, the propeller had been disengaged and the fins placed vertically. Then the Nautilus had shot up at terrifying speed, like a balloon being carried into the atmosphere. It cut through the water with a loud, quivering noise. I could see nothing. In four minutes, we had covered the four leagues between us and the surface, and after leaping into the air like a flying fish, we came hurtling back down into the water, making it splash up to a prodigious height. Chapter 36, entitled Whales. During the night of March 13th and 14th, the Nautilus once again started heading south. I thought that once it got on a parallel with Cape Horn, it would turn west in order to return to the Pacific and finish our tour of the world. But it did nothing of the sort. It merely continued in the direction of the Antarctic. I began to think that the captain's rashness justified Ned Land's worst fears. For some time now, the Canadian had said nothing about escaping. He had become less talkative and now remained silent much of the time. He could see how this prolonged imprisonment weighed on him. Whenever I met the captain, his eyes would gleam with a sullen fire, and I was constantly afraid that his violent instincts would cause him to do something rash. On that day, March 14th, Conseil and he came to find me in my room and asked, and, and I asked, um, I asked them why they had come. We just want to ask you one question, monsieur, said the Canadian. What is it, Ned? How many men do you think there are aboard the Nautilus? I couldn't say. I can't imagine, Ned Land went on that it would take a very large crew to operate a ship like this. The way it's built, I said, ten men should be enough. Well then, said the Canadian, why should there be more? Why? I retorted, looking fixedly at Ned Land, whose intentions were easy, uh, were easy to guess. Because if my guess is correct, and... If I've understood what kind of a man the captain is, the Nautilus is not only a ship, but also a place of refuge for all of those who, like the captain, have broken off relations with life on land. Maybe, said Conseil, but the Nautilus can only hold a certain amount of men, and possibly monsieur could calculate this maximum. How, Conseil? By working it out mathematically, Given the ship's capacity, which Monsieur knows, and therefore the amount of air it contains, given the quantity of air one man needs for breathing, and comparing these results with the fact that the Nautilus has to surface every 24 hours. Conseil did not finish his sentence, but I saw what he was driving at. I understand, I said, but even though this wouldn't be difficult to calculate, the results might only be very approximate. Well, that's all right, said Ned Land insistently. Then here it is, I answered. The amount of oxygen a man uses per hour is equivalent to that contained in a hundred liters of air, and therefore in 24 hours he would need 2,400 liters of air. So we have to find out how many times 2,400 liters the, uh, the Nautilus can contain. 
Precisely, said Conseil. Now, the capacity of the Nautilus is 1,500 tons, and since there are a thousand liters in a ton, the Nautilus contains 1,500,000 liters of air, which, divided by 2,400, I made a rapid calculation with a pencil, gives 625. This means that, strictly speaking, the air in the Nautilus would be enough to support 625 men for 24 hours. 625, repeated Ned. But you can be certain, I added, that between passengers, sailors, and officers, there isn't one-tenth of that number on board. That's still too much for three men, murmured Conseil. So, Ned, I can only advise you to be patient. Not only patient, replied Conseil, but resigned. Conseil had indeed found the right word. After all, he went on, Captain Nemo can't head south forever. He has to stop sometime and come back to more inhabited regions. Then we'll be able to think about escaping again. The Canadian shook his head, rubbed his forehead, and left without saying a word. With monsieur's permission, I would like to point out something, Conseil said. Poor Ned keeps thinking about all, thing, all the things he can't have. He keeps going over his past life. He frets about everything that's now beyond his reach. His memories weigh on him and his heart is heavy. We must try to understand how he feels, that there is for him, what is, what is there for him to do here? Nothing. He is not a scientist like Monsieur. He can share our delights in all the wonders of the sea. He would risk everything just to be in some tavern in his own country. The monotony of life on board must have been unbearable to the Canadian, accustomed as he was to freedom and activity. Very seldom did anything happen that could really interest him. But, nevertheless, that day something occurred which reminded him of his old harpooning days. Toward eleven in the morning, when the Nautilus, uh, with the Nautilus cruising on the surface, we found ourselves in the midst of a herd of whales. This encounter did not surprise me, for I knew that these creatures had been so mercilessly hunted that they had gone to seek refuge in colder waters. The role played by whales in the sailing world and their influence on geographic discoveries has been considerable. It was while following whales that the first Basques, then the Asturians, English, and Dutch learned to brave the dangers of the ocean from one pole to the other. Whales like to frequent Arctic and Antarctic waters. Ancient legends even claim that these creatures had led whalers to within only 15 miles of the North Pole. Even though this statement is false, it is prophetic, for it will probably be through chasing whales into Arctic or Antarctic regions that man will reach one of these unexplored points on the globe. We were sitting on the platform in the midst of a calm sea. The October of these uh, latitudes had been bringing us lovely weather. It was the Canadian, and uh, he never makes mistakes about that sort of, about this that sort of thing, who first sighted a whale on the eastern horizon. By looking carefully, I could see its blackish back rise and fall above the surface five miles from the Nautilus. Ah cried Ned Land. If I were only on board a whaler, what fun this would be. It's a big one. Look at that powerful jet of water it's set sending up. Confound it. Why do I have to be chained to this hunk of steel plate? What? You still haven't gotten over your old ideas about fishing, Ned? Can a whaler ever forget his old profession? Can a man ever get bored with a job that's so exciting? Have you ever hunted whales in these waters, Ned? Never, monsieur. Only in northern waters, in the Bering Straits and the Davis Straits. 
So when you don't know about the southern, then you don't know about the southern whales. Until now, you've uh, only hunted the right whale, a species that would never venture to cross the warm waters near the equator. What are you trying to tell me, Professor? said the Canadian in a somewhat incredulous tone of voice. Just what I said. Rubbish. In 65, that's two and a half years ago, I myself harpooned a whale off Greenland, and embedded in its body we found another harpoon with the mark of a whaler from the Bering Sea. Now I ask you, how could this animal, after being wounded west of America, come to be killed east of America without crossing the equator and making his way either around Cape Horn or the Cape of Good Hope? I agree with Ned, said Conseil, and I'm waiting to see what Monsieur will say. Monsieur will say, my friends, that every species of whale lives within a certain area which it never leaves. And if one of these animals came from the Bering Straits to the Davis Straits, it's quite simply because there exists a passage from one sea to the other along either the coast of America or of Asia. You wouldn't be pulling my leg, asked the Canadian with a wink. No, monsieur, it is perfect. He is, monsieur is being perfectly serious, answered Conseil. In any case, the Canadian went on, since I've never fished in these waters, I don't know what whales are to be found here. That's what I said, Ned. All the more reason to get to know them, retorted Conseil. Look, look, said the Canadian excitedly. It's coming. It's coming towards us. It's thumbing its nose at me. It knows I can't do a thing. Ned stamped his foot. He brandished an imaginary harpoon with his trembling hand. Are these whales as big as those in northern waters? Just about, Ned. Because I've seen big whales in my day up to a hundred feet long. And I've even heard tell of a certain kind of whale around the Aleutian Islands that gets up to 150 feet long. That seems a bit exaggerated, I answered. Those that live around the Aleutians belong to the family of Baleoneptopteridae, <laughs> which have dorsal fins and, like the sperm whale, are usually smaller than the right whale. Look! cried the Canadian, who hadn't taken his eyes off the ocean. It's coming nearer, right up to the Nautilus. Then he once more took up the thread of the conversation. You talk about sperm whales as if they were small, but I've heard people tell of gigantic sperm whales. They're supposed to be very intelligent. They say some of them cover themselves with seaweed and people take, take them for little islands. People get onto them and then set up camp and build a fire. And uh, even build houses? Asked Conseil. You joker, retorted Ned Land. And then one fine day the creature dives and all the people living on it drown. Just like Sinbad the Sailor, I said, laughing. Ah, oh, Master Land, you seem to be awfully fond of tall stories. Those are pretty stupendous sperm whales of yours. I hope you don't believe in them. Professor? The Canadian answered seriously. When it comes to whales, you have to believe just about anything. Look how this one travels. Look how it dives under. They say these animals can go around the world in two weeks. Well, I don't doubt it. But... What you undoubtedly don't know, Mr. Monsieur Aranex, is that the, in the beginning of time, these whales could swim even faster than they can now. Oh, really, Ned? Why? Because in the old days, they had vertical tails like fish, and they moved them from side to side in the water. But the creator saw that they swam too fast, and he twisted their tails and from then on, they've had to move their tails up and down in the water, and they haven't been able to swim as fast. You wouldn't be pulling my leg, would you, Ned? I said, using his same expression. Not too much, 
answered Ned Land. No more than if I could, if I told you about whales 300 feet long and weighing 100,000 pounds. That would be quite a lot, wouldn't it? I said, uh, nevertheless, it must be said that certain whales reach enormous sizes, since some have been said to have furnished up to 120 tons of oil. I've seen them that big, said the Canadian. I believe you, Ned, just as I believe that certain whales are equal in size to a hundred elephants. Can you imagine the effect of such a weight traveling at full speed? It is true, asked Conseil, or I'm sorry, is it true that they can sink ships? No, or at least I don't think so, I answered. But they say that in 1820, in just these southern waters, a whale rushed at the Essex and pushed it backward at a speed of 13 feet per second. Water entered astern, and the Essex almost sank, uh, sank almost immediately. Ned looked at me mockingly. As for me, he said, I've been hit by the tail of one of these animals. It happened in a longboat, of course. My companions and I were thrown 20 feet in the air, but alongside Monsieur's whale, mine was just a baby. Do these animals live a long time? asked Conseil. A thousand years, answered the Canadian without hesitation. How do you know that, Ned? Because that's what people say. But why do they say it? Well, because it's a known fact. No, Ned, it isn't a known fact, but just a superstition. And this is what it's based on. 400 years ago, when men first hunted whales, they grew larger than they do now. It's therefore supposed that, rather logically, that the smaller size of present-day whales is due to the fact that they haven't had time to reach their full development. This is what made Buffon say that the whales could, and undoubtedly did, live a thousand years. Do you understand? Ned Land didn't understand. He wasn't even listening. The whale was getting closer. He couldn't take his eyes off of it. Look, he cried. It isn't just one whale. It's ten, twenty, a whole herd. And to think I have to sit here doing nothing, tied hand and foot. But, Ned, said Conseil, why don't you ask Captain Nemo's permission to hunt them? Conseil hadn't finished his sentence when Ned Land dropped down through the hatch and rushed off in search of the captain. Several moments later, both of them appeared on the platform. Captain Nemo looked at the herd of whales playing in the water a mile or so from the Nautilus. They're black whales, he said. And there are enough of them out there to make a whole fleet of whalers rich. Well, Captain, said the Canadian, couldn't I go out and hunt them, if only so I don't forget how to use a harpoon? What good would it do, answered the Cap ne Captain Nemo, hunting just to destroy? We have no use for whale oil, oil on board. Well, monsieur, said the Canadian. In the Red Sea, you let us hunt a dugong. Then it was a question of getting fresh meat for my crew. Here, it could be killing just for the sake of killing. I know very well that this is one of man's privileges, but I won't permit such murderous pastimes. People like you, Master Land, are very wrong to destroy kind, inoffensive creatures like black whales and right whales. You've already cleared out Baffin Bay, and you're on your way to exterminating, exterminating a useful class of animals. So leave these poor whales alone. They have enough trouble with their natural enemies, such as sperm whales, swordfish, and sawfish, without you getting into the act. I leave the reader to imagine the expression on Ned's face during this little lecture. It was a waste of words to use such arguments with a born hunter. Ned Land looked at Captain Nemo and obviously didn't understand what he meant. Nevertheless, the captain was right. 
The barbarous, unthinking way these animals are hunted will one day wipe out the last whale from the ocean. Ned Land whistled Yankee Doodle between his teeth, stuck his hands in his pockets, and turned his back on us. After watching the whales for a while, Captain Nemo came over to me and said, I was right to say that whales have enough natural enemies without men trying to kill them off. These whales are soon going to be in trouble. Do you see those black dots moving about eight miles to leeward, Mr. Monsieur Aranax? Yes, Captain, I answered. Those are sperm whales, terrible animals. I've sometimes seen them in herds of two or three hundred. They're cruel and destructive, and people are right to kill them. The Canadian turned around brusquely at these words. Well, Captain, there's still time to help out the black whales. There's no use running any risk, Professor. We can disperse these sperm whales well enough with the Nautilus itself. It has a steel spur on its prow that I imagine is just as effective as Master Land's harpoon. The Canadian didn't even bother shrugging his shoulders. The idea of ta uh, attacking whales with a ship's prow? Who had ever heard of such a thing? In a few minutes, Monsieur Aranax, said Captain Nemo, you'll see such hunting as you have never seen before. We'll give them no quarter. These ferocious whales are nothing but mouth and teeth. Mouth and teeth? There was no better way to describe the sperm whale, which sometimes exceeds 80 feet in length. Its huge head takes up roughly a third of its body. It's, uh, it is better armed than the ordinary whale, whose upper jaw is only furnished with whalebone, for it has 25 large teeth, 8 inches high, round and cone-shaped on the top, uh, which weigh about two pounds apiece. Inside the upper part of the creature's head, there are big cavities separated by cartilage, which contain up to eight or nine hundred pounds of that precious whale oil, oil call, or, uh, called spermaceti. The sperm whale is a very ungraceful animal, shaped more like a tadpole than a fish as Friedahl put it. It is badly built, being more or less defective on its left side, with the result that its right is almost totally confined to its right eye. Oh, I'm sorry, that its sight is almost confined to its right eye. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the huge herd was drawing nearer. They had noticed the black whales and were preparing to attack. I knew that the sperm whales would win, not only because they were better adapted for fighting than their harmless adversaries, but also because they could stay longer underwater without coming to the surface to breathe. There was no time to be lost in going to the rescue of these black whales. The Nautilus dove. Conseil, Ned, and I took our places by the glass panels in the lounge. Captain Nemo went up to the helmsman's compartment to wheel his ship like a weapon. Soon I could feel our speed increasing. The struggle between the sperm whales and the black whales had already begun when the Nautilus arrived on the scene. It maneuvered in such a way as to cut off the sperm whales. At first, they seemed to pay no attention to the new monster which had joined the fray. But soon they found they had met their match. What a fight! Even Ned Land became enthusiastic and began clapping his hands. The Nautilus had become a formidable harpoon brandished by the hand of its captain. It would hurl itself against one of these massive creatures and run clean through it, leaving behind two twisting halves of a whale. The submarine was impervious to the blows of their powerful tails nor did we even notice the impact when it struck a whale. Once it had killed one, it would rush on to the next, turning so as not to miss its prey, going forward and backward, obedient to its helm, diving when a whale went for deep water, then coming back up with it when it surfaced, striking it full 
full on or obliquely cutting it in two or merely tearing it open and piercing with its terrible spur in any direction or any at any speed. What carnage! What noise on the surface! What sharp hissing and strange roars terrified animals let, let out! Lower down, where the water is usually so calm, their tails churned up the sea as if a storm were raging. This Homeric massacre went on for an hour, and there was no way the sperm whales could escape. Several times, ten or twelve of them got together and tried to crush the Nautilus with their weight. Through the glass panels we could see their huge mouths full of teeth and their formidable eyes. Ned Land was beside himself, menacing and cursing them. He could feel them clinging to the submarine like dogs seizing a wild boar. But the Nautilus would merely put on speed and either drag them along or force them back up to the surface, indifferent both to their enormous weight and the power of their huge jaws. Finally, the herd of sperm whales began to thin out. The waters once again became calm. I could feel the ship surfacing. The hatch was opened, and we rushed out on the platform. The sea was covered with mutilated carcasses. A powerful explosion could not have torn open these huge creatures more violently. We were floating amid gigantic humped bodies with bluish backs and white bellies. Several terrified sperm whales were fleeing out toward the horizon. The water had turned red for several miles in either direction, and the Nautilus was floating in a sea of blood. Captain Nemo rejoined us. Well, Master Land, he said. Well, Monsieur, answered the Canadian, whose enthusiasm had by now died down. There's no doubt about it. It's a, it was a terrible sight. But I'm a hunter, not a butcher, and this was nothing but a massacre. It was a massacre of harmful animals, answered the captain. The Nautilus is not a butcher knife. I prefer my harpoon, retorted the Canadian. Each man to his own weapon, answered the captain, looking fixedly at Ned Land. I feared Ned might get carried away and do something violent, which would have serious consequences for us. But his anger was distracted by the sight of a whale floating near the Nautilus. It was one which had not been able to escape from the sperm whales. I recognized the black or southern whale with its compressed head. Anatomically, it is distinguished from the right whale and the North Cape whale by the fact that its several cervical vertebrae are joined together and that it has two more ribs. This poor creature was dead, lying on its side with its belly bitten open. A baby whale, which the mother had not yet been able to save from the massacre, still hung to her mutilated fin. The water ran in her mouth and over her whalebone like a murmuring undertow. Captain Nemo brought the Nautilus alongside the cadaver. Two of his men got off onto the whale and, to my great surprise, started milking her. By the time they were through, they had enough to fill two or three casks. The captain offered me a glass of this mi still warm milk. I could not refrain from showing my distaste for this sort of drink, but he assured me that it was not only excellent, but indistinguishable from cow's milk. I tasted it and was forced to agree with him. It, therefore, provided us with a useful reserve stock, for this milk, in the form of salted butter or cheese, brought a pleasant change to our usual diet. From that day on, I began to worry about Ned Land, for I noticed that his ill will toward Captain Nemo was increasing. I resolved to keep a close watch on the Canadian. And that my friends, is the end of chapter 36. 
ends on something of a downer there as a whole bunch of whales get massacred, but oh well, I'm not Jules Verne, so uh, he's the one who, uh, who wanted it that way, and so our characters are going on their adventure and are continuing on their world trip, and I hope you will join me on Monday at 4 p.m. as we read the next two chapters of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Uh, I hope you can join me. Have a good weekend. Have a good rest of your Friday, and we'll see you again. Bye, everyone.